Welcome to AfterBuzz TV's Spotlight On series, where we interview some of Hollywood's hottest up-and-comers. Today, I have the brilliant and talented Lauren LaGrasso in studio, whose new single, Road to Glory, is dropping very soon. Not only is she very talented, but I must admit she's one of my favorite people in the world. We're talking to her right after this. I'm Maria Menunos, and you're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Spotlight On here on After Buzz TV. As I mentioned, this is the series where we interview some of Hollywood's hottest up-and-comers in TV, film, music, podcasting, anything creative. And uh, I have a very creative person in studio with me today. Her name is Lauren LaGrasso. As I mentioned at the top, I respect Lauren a lot as a musician and an artist, but also I have known Lauren for a long time. A few years now, Jeff. A few Jeff. years, yes. I'll never forget our first meeting I back at the old After Buzz TV. Yes, Lauren uh, <laughs> helped build this network, I will say. Oh um, my gosh, well that's an honor. Yeah. I, I feel like I came along as pretty well established, but I definitely have been honored to have my roots here. Definitely, but now you are um, pursuing sing singing, songwriting, your creative coaching. There's just so much we're going to get into today. Primarily, you're here to promote your new single, Road to Glory, which I've listened to and I like very much. Oh, thank God. You're welcome. I know. I really <laughs> earnestly think it's great. And we're going to get into it in just a minute. But also, I'm excited because Lauren and I sort of share some of the same DNA. We come from the same upbringing. We're both in the Midwest. And I think both have really enjoyed the journey of trying to figure out how the complicated road of pursuing your dreams in Los Angeles. So Enjoyed, cried, yes. <laughs> screamed. Wept. Wept. Yeah. And ultimately decided we're going to stick it out because we believe in the power of our dreams. Absolutely. I think that could not have been better said than the way you just said it right now. So <laughs> I'm very excited to get into it. Um, just so I can give an official bio, Lauren is a singer-songwriter, podcast producer, host, and creativity coach. She's working with her EP, Jeff Bova, who's executive producing her new EP, which is coming out next year sometime. But your single, Road to Glory, is dropping exactly when? Friday. This Friday, Friday which is perfect. Friday the 8th of November, 2019. Nice. Well, I think what I want to do right now is just tease the single. Ryan, you should have it queued up, I think, on a SoundCloud tab right there. I have it queued up perfectly, that first chorus, and here we go. Let's listen to it. All right. Ooh. That like I don't want to talk over it, but you can talk over it. Okay. Gosh, I I want to keep listening, but I also know we just have to tease it for we our have to audience. Tease it. So. You got to make people want it. Um, <laughs> what I want to talk about specifically with this song is the way you've incorporated different styles into it. Mm -hmm. I really do feel like you're sort of telling a story with this song, and at the beginning, it's kind of this quiet ambient thing and then all of a sudden there are these gospel vocals and the moment I oohed right there was because I was so impressed by some of the synth influences you have so wow Jeff good ear well I it's I'm know. really I'm impressed like before me working on this album I never would have known what a synth even sounded like I guess you know I'm, yeah. I'm a big music fan that's so amazing though and my, it's so great to have that kind of like a, a technical listening ability well I did I really wanted to make sure I gave it like a very thorough listen and I will say, I listened to it once, liked it so much, I listened to it a number more times just to have. Um, but I want to talk about that choice to not, you know, there are some songs where it's kind of one consistent tone throughout. And mm -hmm. I feel like this, not only are you incorporating a kind of different styles and tones, but it seems like it's this deliberate decision to make it grow throughout the entire song. Yeah, well, I definitely wanted it to be anthemic, and I think that, uh, like any good journey, it's not going to be interesting if it starts out huge and then just stays huge or starts out small and doesn't go anywhere. So I wanted it to show the journey of the song and also my experience, because this song, Road to Glory, is all about my journey in Hollywood and pursuing a creative life mm -hmm. and the grit and the pain and the tears, but how it's all worth it if that's really what you have to do. And yeah. that all of those things, all the suffering you go through all actually makes you stronger and that the road to glory never really ends, hmm. you know? Yeah, it's interesting because the song kind of has this feeling of it could go on forever. I think maybe mm -hmm. because of the way it builds and the way you're incorporating different styles, but it feels both like it's totally finite, but also like it could continue. Yeah, and I feel like that's what the journey of being a creative person is like. Mm -hmm. You know, just when you think you've reached the pinnacle, 
there's a new level that you have to go to. Mm. Or when you think you're, sometimes when you think you're at the pinnacle, you actually have to slide down a little bit before you can go back up. Hmm. So I, I hope that that is incorporated in there. And I think you're saying that it is. I would say certainly. <laughs> um, I was looking at some of your influences and artists you really respect, and I saw like Janis Joplin, and um, I think, did I see um, Joni Mitchell on there as well? Love Joni Mitchell. Yeah. I, I love that kind of like badass folksy singer-songwriter, but what's cool is I feel like you're incorporating those influences, but it does have a distinctly modern sound. Mm -hmm. Well, so here's the deal, and you know a little bit of this story because I told a bit of it on the Tomorrow Show, mm -hmm. our sister show. Check it out. Check it out. But... The song was originally like a straight rock song. And then I realized, so it was like ready to go out a year ago, 2018, fall 2018, like I was going to release my EP. And we realized that me and my producer and this other woman I was working with, Carrie Cole, realized that it sounded a bit dated. Like it sounded like an 80s rocker song. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it just didn't feel like me. Like it never felt like me to be like solely in the rock area. Like what I always associated with were like soul singers, folk singers, singer songwriters, mm -hmm. pop. Like that's what felt more authentic. So we went back to the drawing board and kind of figured out the different influences that we wanted to incorporate and put that song through that filter instead and came out with this amazing mix that's way more modern but still incorporates it's like pop rock soul I mean I wouldn't say I hear a ton of folk in it but like pop rock and soul solidly I feel like lyrically it's folksy yeah. you know um, which I really appreciate I think the other thing I really like about the mix is I feel like a lot of times if you're a pretty close listener you can sort of anticipate drops or sort of predict when there's going to be maybe an up tempo percussive change or something like that but I feel like on this listen I'm surprised by when these drops or these changes in the timbre of the song are like executed Yeah was that a goal too uh, well, you know, you'd have to ask my producer on that one because he really was responsible for so much of that mix. Like I was in the room with him, mm -hmm. but he took the song and transformed the production into what it is now. But I would think so. I mean, like you never want the listener to be able to guess what comes next. When I'm listening to a song and I can guess the next note or I can guess the next lyric, it's always kind of disappointing. Like yeah. I like it when somebody surprises me. Yeah, I think like the perfect pop is kind of doing both. It's mm -hmm. it's almost like it surprises you, but when that surprise happens, you're like, oh, that's perfect. That's right. exactly what it should have been, even yeah. though I didn't predict it. Exactly. It can't give you the like, ooh, what was that? Because yeah. like people might not know exactly what they're hearing. Like not everyone's as astute of a listener as you are, but oh, they know when you. something is wrong. Yeah. Like you innate it, there's that book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Mm. You innately know when something doesn't feel right. Like you know if you go to the wrong chord progression or like there's a weird off key note. Mm -hmm. Like you you feel that so it's like keeping someone surprised but also staying in a place that is melodically pleasing yeah i love to hear you talk about that because you're it is pop music that you're producing i think it's interesting and it's pop with some unpredictability but this isn't necessarily like avant-garde type of so can you speak to trying to lean into those instincts of melodic um like pleasant music that you like but also trying to carve out something unique Sure. I mean, honestly, I'm going to be straight with you. I just sing whatever comes to me. Like, mm. I, I'm not sitting down being like, oh, I wonder, like, how I can surprise people today. Like, I sing what feels good. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't start writing music till later in life, and I know it's not late in real life, but, like, for a musician to not know that they're a songwriter until this age is pretty late. Mm -hmm. I didn't write a song till I was 23. So because of that, I completely wrote on feeling because I didn't know any rules at that point. Mm. And then after that, I educated myself and started taking songwriting classes, started getting you know more into my guitar skills. But still to this day, I'm more writing what feels good. And then I'll go back and look and see, OK, like, could this melody be a little bit more pleasing? Is it like in the cut? Is it um, leading into the pre-chorus the mm. right way? You know, but the first thing I do is just sing whatever comes out. Do you lyrics first, melody second, melody first, lyrics second? Um, it depends on the song. For this song, I actually wrote a bulk of it in an airplane, believe it or not. Nice. So I kept going to the bathroom so that my seatmate wouldn't think I was crazy. <laughs> and I would like sing into my phone and then go back out. And I, I think it was at the Cincinnati airport. It was back when I used to do auto shows to make money. Oh, yeah. And I remember like walking through the airport and singing into my phone. But then I just left it alone for like... I don't know, months. And then I came back. My friend Jordan helped me figure out the initial chords for the song, left it alone again. Then I finished the rest of it in a car in Detroit, like driving in downtown Detroit. And uh, then the song was like pretty much done after that. So like most of it was like all at once. 
I love that though. It's so like thematically perfect that you were moving when you wrote this song. That's that's a great point. It's really cool. Because the song really does move. Yeah, and that's what it's about. Yeah. And so yeah, so then I did that and then like a year ago I did a rewrite with this great singer songwriter called Miranda Glory. Mm. Um so yeah, it's been it's definitely been in segments, but the bulk of the song came in the plane. Music is so inherently collaborative. You talked about working with Miranda Glory. You've talked about working with your producers. Do you like the collaborative aspect of music? Yes, because it makes you better. Mm. Good. Yeah. Because I would think some musicians, I guess if, you, if you're unable to work with others, this just isn't the industry I mean, for listen, maybe if I was a prodigy, I would feel different. But like, I know that I don't know everything. I have weaknesses. My, my greatest strengths are that... I'm like really lyrically strong. Mm -hmm. I um, go with my gut and like what feels good. And I've got a, a interesting take on melody, but I am not the most classically trained musician. So there's gonna be some weird things I do. Sometimes they really work, which is actually why my producer said he wanted to work with me. He said, cool. because I, um, I make choices that other musicians don't make. Like mm -hmm. I'm not tied to a traditional song structure. That's why he was interested in working with me. But she's like, oh, that's nice to hear that you don't have to be perfect or like follow the rules in mm. order to do this um but yeah i think it's good to work with people who have skill sets that you don't have yeah absolutely well that's really cool and um road to glory drops this friday guys i if you can't tell i really like this song i'm not just <laughs> saying that it feels kind of cinematic to me i'm like why isn't this in like a movie well we got to get it in a movie that's like that's the, next the goal yeah i yeah. want to get it in a movie i want to get it on sports like you know to be an anthem for sports teams oh, i, yeah. I want to have it in a commercial that's like yeah. you know spoiler alert to those at home because of the way um, music is now, you don't make a ton of money from streaming anymore. Yeah. But you can make a lot of money from getting your song in a commercial and going on tour. Like those are like the big ways is getting um, music placements through music supervisors. Like there's actually a person who does that job, mm -hmm. who picks out all the music, which I never knew growing up and that would be a really cool job for someone. And then also going on tour is a great way to make money. Gosh, I now that you're pitching commercials, I'm like Gatorade. Yes. There's like Nike. Let's get them on the line, Let's Jeff. Make it happen. I love it. <laughs> um, well, I want to talk about. We've sort of have been skirting the conversation, but inherent in this process is just leaning into and sort of navigating your own creativity, your own mm -hmm. creative urges. A ton of our listeners are creatives. But the reason it's so important to have you in studio right now is because you did it. You have this single that's releasing Friday and you shot a music video. And yeah. so many creative people have urges to do something, but they never really find a way to do it. And that's part of the reason you're also a creative coach. Mm -hmm. I want to ask first, what does that mean to be a creative coach? Basically, something that I've realized is one of my special skills is I can listen to like a whole litany of things that a person does and then distill them down into a sentence hmm. and help them take that from an idea to a reality. So that can mean a bevy of different things, but that's kind of the overarching purpose of it. And I think that's your question, right? That's definitely my question. You <laughs> nailed it. Um, it relates to your podcast, Unleash Your Inner Creative. Can you speak to what this podcast is for those who maybe haven't heard it? Yes. So my podcast is my baby. I believe that's why I have finally brought this album forth after working on it for four years. Mm. Um, but it's a show that is meant to help the listener make creativity the filter for their life, claim the word creative, redefine their relationship with fear and lessen fear's grip on their choices. And through those things, hopefully step closer into being the real person you are, into the full essence of your humanity. So well said. I'm like, damn. <laughs> uh, claim your creative is a really compelling way to talk about our relationship with our own creativity. Mm -hmm. Can you like elaborate on what you mean? Sure. So I believe everyone is creative, even people who don't think that they are. Like, for instance, my dental hygienist, mm -hmm. she cleaned my teeth the other day, like did like a brush before she actually like went in with the pick and like started doing like heavy digging in there. Mm -hmm. I never had had anyone do it before like that. Mm. And I thought that was such a creative way to approach it because that way, when she went in with the scary things, like, you know, those picks that look like they're digging for gold, it didn't hurt as bad because she'd already done the gentle cleansing. Mm. So it's like, what is the most creative way you can approach everything in life? And um, like I talk about finding creativity in the mundane. So like making creativity the filter for your life, because if you can find it in the mundane, like let's say like picking up dog poop or cleaning your kitchen, it's gonna be easier to access in those big moments. And mm. I think it's important to claim the word creative because as human beings, it's an innate part of who we are. I had this realization recently that 
creativity is what our very world is made of. There's mm. this wonderful quote by Dr. Wayne Dyer that says, everything that exists is was once imagined. That means even our entire universe. That means that the stuff that we're made of is creative essence mm. and that it is our birthright. And so by claiming that, we're claiming our humanity and our ability to see what isn't there yet. I feel like there is an aversion to creativity in our culture. Mm. Do you agree with that? Explain. I just feel like, I feel like when you're a kid, it's so encouraged and like, look how creative my child is. But by mm -hmm. the time you're choosing college application or ch majors for college and you're applying to schools and you're entering, quote, the real world, that's sort of viewed as like a red flag or something to shy away from. Right. Because people are scared. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like your parents might discourage you, not because they don't believe in you, but because they are afraid for you. It isn't a stable lifestyle to right. do something that is a traditionally creative field or even to do something that is a traditional field in a creative way. However, I mean, would you rather sink into yourself and die a slow death? I wouldn't. Right. I would rather be sad sometimes pursuing the life that I want than sad all the time pursuing a life that makes me miserable. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because I think so many people... They're unable to, another thing you mentioned was just facing the fear of knowing that you have this germ inside of you that has to grow. You know, we're both in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I think it's an unconventional career choice for us to be pursuing what we are. And we're both making it happen, which is great. But it does lead to heartbreak and anguish and pain. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you encourage people who are afraid to face that, but also know that this is kind of the only choice that they have? Well, there's a few different ways. I've definitely been in that position before. You know, it's like we've all been crippled by fear at some point. Mm -hmm. But you, one good way is to ask yourself, what's the worst thing that can happen? And actually just like keep going. Like, it, OK, if that happens, then what happens? And then usually what you find, like even if you fail miserably, you have to think, would that failure be worse than never trying? Hmm. Like, what could I forgive myself for more? Could I forgive myself for failing but going at it full force or could I forgive myself for staying in my house and dying with my music still in me mm. wow. I, I couldn't forgive myself for that because that means I never took a chance on myself I never believed in myself but as long as I tried I can be okay with that if I fail yeah so um I just had a question highlighted it now oh <laughs> Perfect. So do you feel like you sort of entered creative coaching as a way to coach yourself? Because I feel like, yeah, can you speak to that? <laughs> so I like, by the way, like creative coaching is something that I'm still like kind of dipping the toes in the water of. I'm like not like fully delved into it. But like the reason I started my podcast was because I needed some serious help. Like I had been sitting on this music for three and a half years and it was just dragging. Mm -hmm. And I realized I mean, I've definitely struggled with mental health over my lifetime, and I realized all the times I've been most depressed in my life was because I was repressing my creativity. Mm. And that was like when this phrase came to my mind, Rep repressed creativity is the cause of so much of the world's suffering. Because we all have these lives inside of us that we're crushing down, and you can only live like that for so long before you either decide to make a different choice or something really, really bad happens. Hmm. And so I wanted to help other people as I helped myself Stop pushing those lives down. Yeah. Because I've known what I wanted since I was three, you know? But you get wrapped up and you get opportunities, quote unquote, and sometimes they are, but sometimes they take you away from your ultimate purpose or your ultimate goal or why you came here. And so I did the show because I was letting fear rule my life. I wasn't making creativity the filter for my life. And I wasn't stepping into the full essence of who I was. And that was, you know, something I shared with the audience from the beginning is as I'm giving you these tools, as I'm asking people these questions, I'm also asking them for myself mm. because I need the help. And guess what? I'm still not fully there. It's going to be a constant journey. I hope I continue to grow for the rest of my life. But yeah, it hasn't always been something that was innate to me. I look back though, though now and realize that I needed my full 20s to, to grow. Mm-hmm. And that if it happened for me when I first moved here, when I was like 22, 23, I would have buckled under the pressure. I wouldn't have been able to handle it. Mm. And I mean, if I could go back and tell myself one thing, it's like, don't be so hard on yourself, but also keep pushing. Mm. It's like a mixture of like, go a little further, but also you don't have to be in a personal fight club on the way there. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's like, don't don't waste your bandwidth hating yourself, right. you know, because you only have so much bandwidth and 
You know, it's if you're if you're taking away from your potential by being hard on yourself, it's costing you time. Yeah. You know, I think that's the big cost. J- J.K. Rowling, who, you know, wrote the Harry Potter series, of course. Which, what one? <laughs> <laughs> it's like this book about wizards. Um, she spoke at Harvard, actually. She gave the commencement speech like 10 years ago. And the thesis statement of her speech was like, creativity and imagination are are the engine for empathy. And like people who are unable to empathize are simply not being creative enough. Yeah. Which is a really wise perspective. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Because they're shutting themselves off from who they are. How could you empathize with someone if you're not letting yourself be who you are? Right. You can't see someone else if you're not being yourself. Totally. Or you're not creative enough to imagine someone else's life. I think that was her point, too, as well. Also that. But that probably wasn't her point, but that's that's my take <laughs> on it. And that, that's a good point. Both of them. I mean, I just think it's I think people sometimes roll their eyes or turn up their nose at the idea of creativity. But well, because it sounds fluffy. Mm-hmm. But here's a here's another statistic for those that don't really care about creativity. In 50 years, 80 percent of all jobs are going to require some form of creativity. So even if you think creativity is fluffy and it's not a real solid skill, you're wrong. It's the one thing. It's I think there's like three things that computers can't do, and it's one of them. Wow. Yeah. So it's actually a necessary life skill for us to be financially viable in the future, in addition to being, I think, the healing balm for the soul. Wow, that's so well said. Um, speaking of creativity, I want to talk about actually the practical steps that you took to bring this music that you were sitting on for three and a half, four years and making it happen. You have a single, you have a music video, they're dropping Friday. Can you speak to sort of the practical steps that our listeners can take to achieve their vision? Yes, I can. I'm going to tell you, it took like way longer than it will probably take someone else because I was tied up in a couple things as this was happening. Mm -hmm. So if you're pursuing multiple things at once, sometimes certain things take a a backseat. That was okay because I needed to grow as a musician and as a person. But the first thing I did was I wrote the songs. Like I had a, a huge number of songs. I think I had like 60 songs when I went to my producer. I knew I wanted to make an EP. Oh, first you have to find a producer. So that's number one. Unless you're a producer yourself, which is great. Um, found this guy, Jeff. I sent him my music. He said, yes, I'd love to work with you. We went in the studio. We laid down scratch tracks. Um, the thing you should do next, if you are a person who is a musician, like on my side of things that I didn't do, which is why this process has taken longer, is have reference tracks Mm. for your producer. So you go in with your song, but then you also have a song that you like. I'm sorry, guys, my my ring keeps hitting the table. I gesticulate a lot because I'm Italian. But (laughs) you have a song that you like that's like a similar vibe to what you want. You say like, you know, take the bass from here and then you bring another one and like, I like the tempo of this Mm. song. And the problem with me is I went in without that because I was so green to this industry and to what it really took to make an album. Um, that I didn't know I had to do the A&R myself. Hmm. And so Jeff, my producer, was kind of like guessing for me based on what I was giving to him. So I highly recommend going in with reference tracks for every single song you make. Then from there, your producer will make a scratch track. You sing over that. After that, after you decide that that's like basically the direction you want to go in, you get your musicians in. They record the real... Because like what Jeff does is like he puts down... um, computerized instruments and then after that we would have like the guitarist come in and play the computerized instruments that we'd put down um then you have like backup singers and so on and so forth then you lay down your vocals and then after that you uh get it mixed and mastered you want to get it mixed by a separate person from who masters it Hmm. because it's just good checks and balances just like the government and then after that, you find a place to distribute it. So I use TuneCore. It's a really simple place. You can also use something like uh, CD Baby. Um, and that pushes it out literally everywhere. Like wow. th- places I've never heard of. I think it's like over 100 different music distribution platforms across countries. And uh, then you just, you know, just put it out on the internet and see what happens. Well, we're going to get it in commercials. <laughs> it's gonna happen. That's right, honey. Um, so the EP is going to be how many tracks? The EP will be five tracks total, Perfect. including the song that you've heard. And question related to that, not only with the song, but with the EP, how do you know when it's like done, like capital D done? Because that's the hard thing about production for filmmakers, for mm-hmm. musicians. At what point do you look at your script and say, this is ready? Okay. I think that there's a few ways. You have to know the difference between anxiety and gut. We, mm-hmm. We've talked about this a little bit before, but the anxiety is just like the lies that your brain will tell you when you're scared of how someone might react to something. 
gut is your your essence, like your higher self telling you that something's not ready. Mm. So last year when the songs weren't ready, my gut told me to stop. This year, my anxiety is like, oh, I don't know if it's ready, but like it's ready. It's I've taken it as far as I can, and I don't know how to explain that other than when you know, you know. And mm. I hate it when people say that when it comes to relationships, but it's true when it comes to your your art. Like, yeah. when you know, you know. You've you've taken something as far as you can, and maybe that's where your skill set ends that day. If you were doing it a year later, maybe it would be even better. But for me, I just knew, like, this is as good as I can do, and I like it. You know what else? <laughs> I think the anxiety is probably stemming from the fact that you actually do know that it's done. Yeah. You know that the next step is to let your baby fly. Yeah. And that's the scary part. And people can do whatever they want with it once right. it's out there. Yeah. I want. I don't remember who said it, but I heard a musician once say, like, once you release a song, it's not yours anymore. It's the world's. Wow. Man. And that's true with anything creative. Once you put it out into the ether, like people can react to it the way they want to. I think you also have to learn how to separate yourself from people's reactions, which yeah. I'm not great at. I'm a very sensitive person. You know, I think when people tell you they don't love something, though, it's them doing them the favor of telling you that they're honest. You know, that's a gift. Wait, what? Like if someone <laughs> says, I think, you know, you could live in a world where everyone just tells you something is great. Yeah. But you don't necessarily know if they're being transparent, where if someone says this isn't to my taste, you can appreciate the fact that they're actually respecting you enough to give you their honest opinion. Yeah, I think depending on the situation, like there's sometimes when it's helpful and there's sometimes when it's not helpful. Mm. Like it'd be really helpful if they said that before you release the song. <laughs> but after it's like, why don't you just say congratulations and move on with your life? Yeah, that's true. It's, it's not know? productive to say I don't like this. Yeah. Yeah. Like I never do dislikes on YouTube videos. I just think it's mean spirited. Yeah. What's the benefit? What's the benefit? Like unless someone's making a hate video. Yeah. I think you just keep your opinion to yourself. Right. Well, that's I think that's wise. And I think yeah. that's something we could do more of with in 2019. Yeah. Or if you're trying to help me with like my next album. But if it's not constructive, I don't really need to hear your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm super excited about the EP, Lauren. I love the song. And again, you just I think you just have especially lately been carrying this energy of inspiration that's very contagious. So I want to credit mm -hmm. you for that. And I hope our listeners are feeling the same thing because there's a lot of wisdom to be said about the dangers of repressed creativity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, there, I don't, I hate to say it cause it's, it sounds a little weird, but another thing that made me think about this is a lot of serial killers were creatives. Wow. Yeah. Hitler. Yeah. I hate to say that. It's disgusting. But... but like, I do think about what if, I, I mean, you know, he was a maniac, so maybe he's not the best example, but there's so many people like, what if they had just taken that, um, that wild energy that they used for something so evil yeah. and put it toward art? Wow. That untamed beast mm -hmm. inside. I mean... Yeah, of course Hitler was a maniac, but you do think, what if he wouldn't have been as aggressively maniacal if he had had an outlet? Like, I don't know, yeah. super interesting. Well, man, this has gone by very, very fast. The last thing I like to do is just kind of have a conversation about this year in art. I love asking creative people who I respect what they're liking. Um, so I want to know if you've seen a movie this year that you consider your favorite. Ooh, I don't watch that many movies. Oh, but... Bird Box. Was that what it was called? I think technically Bird, that was last year. Bird but that was a fun Box. film. I think I watched it this year, though. Yeah. So I like that one. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> favorite t new TV show this year that you watched? Oh, the one that is on Hulu. The Boys. I think it's called The Boys. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great show. Loved it. And Very I didn't expect to like it because I usually don't like superhero things just because I feel like they're overdone. Yeah. But that was such an interesting take. Yeah, it kind of was pushing back against the idea of superhero Loved things. it. It's a superhero show for people who don't really like superhero shows, I would say. Right. Um, favorite new artist musically that you've been enjoying this year? I love Billie Eilish mm -hmm. and Lizzo. Cool. What do you think Billie Eilish and Lizzo are doing to kind of cut through the pop scene? Because both of them have had these big, big years. Being themselves. Yeah. Unapologetically, not trying to do what everyone else has done. If you could work with any artist, they could be someone who's like really hot right now or someone who's still around but maybe isn't doing as much. Who would you be excited to work with? I have to say Billy Joel because he mm. was the first person I listened to and dissected his music. Like I would in high school, there was a, a I don't even know what it was called, like a big Billy Joel lyrics website. And I would just go through every song and read his lyrics. And I felt so seen and so understood. So he was the first person I looked up to and thought, wow, like if I could do what he does, that'd be really cool. I'd be so intimidated to work with him. But that would be amazing. 
And I also, I love Sarah Bareilles mm. and Fiona Apple. Have you listened to the Waitress soundtrack at all? Yeah, have She's I? kind of a genius. So she's an amazing genius. And I, I just think she's such a cool person. I read mm-hmm. her book um, last year as I was like about to like restart the process of doing the tracks and like re-singing and rewriting them. And it gave me a lot of inspiration. Cool. I love that. I have loved this conversation, Lauren. I wish we had more time, but we really are running out. It goes oh, by gosh, so fast. Oh, gosh, Jeff. Um, last thing, any like statements or anything you'd like to say about the album before it comes out, just for fans to expect or what to look out for? Well, I just want to say I'm really honored to be a songwriter. Yeah. Like, I didn't, growing up, I never thought that that was something I would get to do. I didn't even know I was a songwriter till so late in life. And so... I'm honored to be a songwriter. I'm so excited that I finally am able to share these songs with everyone. I hope that they bring people peace and that it helps them to know that they're not alone, that it's never too late for your dreams and that you can always keep going. And, um, you know, that angsty optimism is a good thing. You Mm. know, you can be someone who's anxious and at times depressed and still believe the best possible thing is going to happen. And... Believe in yourself, always. And I hope that this music helps you to believe in yourself, that it helps you to feel less alone, that it is a healing balm for your soul. And I just appreciate you listening. Wow. I think there's nothing better to go out on than that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lauren LaGrasso. Lauren, thank you so much for being here today. Jeff, thank you. You got it. So just so you guys know, the single's called Road to Glory. It comes out this Friday. Both the track and the music video, right? No, the music video is coming out a little later. It's going to be coming out in December. So oh, we're great. teasing you. And then I'm also I'm uh, doing a public speaking event. I'm talking about creativity cool. on the 9th, this coming Saturday at the Pretty Thing Tour. And then I'm doing a live show on Monday, November 11th. It would have been my grandparents' 69th wedding anniversary at Bar Lubitsch at 8.30 p.m. So I'd love to see anyone who's local there. And the uh, creative coach, you're going to be doing this, uh, the tour one more time. Yes. So I'm going to be doing a speaking engagement. I'm a, uh, they call it like a keynote speaker at the Pretty Thing Tour. Which is in LA. That was the only thing. This is in LA, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. It's in Marina Del Rey. Great. Just wanted to clarify that. (laughs) And they can follow you at Lauren LaGrasso on all platforms, right? At Lauren LaGrasso. You can find all the information there. Great. Well, Lauren, we will be glued to your social media to see the rest of these single drops and then eventually the EP as well. Um, I can say, I'm not just saying this, I'm a big fan of the song and I can't wait to see the rest of the album. If you guys want to keep up with me, you can do that at Jeffrey C. Graham on Twitter, Jeffrey Crane Graham on Instagram. If you're a fan of The Bachelor, I do daily Bachelor updates, Oh, actually. my gosh. I got to check those out. Yeah, it's been a, a surprisingly, like, um, well-engaged little segment I've been doing. So check that out on our After Buzz TV reality channel. Lauren, thank you one more time for being here. Jeff, I adore you. Thank you for having me. You got it. And we'll <laughs> see you guys next time here on Spotlight On, only on After Buzz TV. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal. 